Hello once again watchers of my videos and lovers of Game of Thrones. My name is Nick Pell and this is once again coming from my white room. Now if you've been watching my videos set for at least a year now you know that last summer I reviewed the, the Song of Ice and Fire series in full. Right off the bat just so everyone is notified this will be a spoiler video. Um, I'm not going to do a spoiler free video because that would take much too long and it wouldn't really do the show justice. So, I'm not going to do a spoiler for your video. This is going to be, I'm not going to do anything at the end of the video after the credits. I'm going to be just talking about season three in full of Game of Thrones right now. So, if you have not finished season three or you are not sufficiently caught up, do not watch this <laughs> because you will be very annoyed and frustrated and disappointed if you watch this without knowing what season three entailed. So, uh, with that being said, let's just dive right into it. This is gonna be a long video, as you can see down here, but what do you do? <sighs> a lot of characters to go through. So, um, I'm gonna do this kind of same fashion as I did my book reviews for um, Game of Thrones, and so let's start off with these characters. The people that this season kind of focused on, for the most part, is Rob Stark and Catelyn. Um, Basically, at the end of season two, Rob Stark declared himself king of the North, and basically went into war against Lannisters, primarily Joffrey, and uh, that is basically what his story in the season details. And um, we see him get married, um, as in the book, to uh, his wife, whose name I do not remember, and uh, we see them together for a good chunk of the season. I thought that worked really well. They got together in a in a good way. I don't know if it followed the book exactly in that same fashion. I know that they get married, but but yeah. Uh, and then towards the end of the season, um, we have uh, Rob's wife pregnant, um, and that is something which actually deviates from the book itself because in the story she does not get pregnant, um, as far as I remember. And uh, so yeah, that's a thing. Um, Rob and Catelyn, they kind of start to rebuild their bond again towards the end of the season. At the end of, or during uh, season two, Catelyn let Jamie Lannister go um, in hopes of getting Sansa and Arya back. Um, obviously, Sansa is in the hands of the Lannisters, so they're not going to give her up. Arya is gone from the King's Landing, so that's not really going to be any use. Um, she doesn't know that, but she lets Jamie go. We get to see that kind of kinship um, rebuild itself over the course of the season, which was really nice to see, especially in Rob and Catelyn's finale episode, um, episode nine of the season, The Reigns of Castamere. <clears throat> this was the big event which spewed the internet and frustrated and riled up basically everyone who has not read the books um, because this was the Red Wedding. We have Rob Stark and Catelyn getting massacred, basically. Uh, they go to the wedding um, at the Twins, and uh, it's at the wedding feast, and they're basically ambushed by the Twin soldiers. And uh, Rob Stark gets taken out by Roose Bolton, and uh, Catelyn gets her, gets her throat slit. So uh, <clears throat> it was a very, very well done scene very dark even for me who has read the books and knew that this was coming at some point it, it still kind of brought a few chills and because it was so well done and so well executed so uh in terms of the actors i thought that they did a really good job for this season i look forward to seeing more of their work assuming that they do more movies or tv shows or whatever they do, end up doing in the future moving on to Jon snow um this guy at the end of season two we see him with yigret and he is basically about to be inducted into the Wildlings, kind of. Uh, he goes and meets with um, the main Wildling, whose name is slipping me right now. It'll be in down here. He meets that guy, and he basically starts to live among the Wildlings. Um, him and Yigret form a um, sexual relationship, and uh, they are essentially man and wife because Jon Snow captured her. Um, and in wild and culture, that is uh, kind of how you marry someone, apparently. So that happens. Jon Snow breaks his Night's Watch vow um, in terms of not uh, being with a woman. And uh, he just kind of starts to um, become a part of this society in a sense. He's still very much an outsider for the majority of the season. And 
Uh, we see this by the constant reminder of the guy who can uh, put himself in the hawk. Um, he constantly does not trust Jon Snow and is saying that, oh, this guy is bad, he's going to betray us, stuff like that. <clears throat> and then in uh, the season 9 episode, again, this was the big episode where a lot of things happened. Jon Snow, uh, he um, is very close to Bronn, who we'll talk about later in this review. Um, and uh, he basically um, will not kill this farmer who um, the wildlings are so intent on just killing because they don't think it matters at all. And um, he's up front of the Night's Watch. Um, <clears throat> I should probably jump back a little bit. Late, earlier in the season, uh, uh, the wildlings climbed up the wall. Um, that was a very intense moment. Um, and they got over onto the other side of it. So that's how they're in that situation. And so. Uh, because he would not kill the farmer, uh, Jon Snow has to fight his way out, um, and takes out Mr. Hawk guy, whose name I still don't remember, um, gets kind of cut up by the guy's hawk, and then, uh, is able to make off with a horse. And then, uh, in the very last episode, um, we see a final confrontation between him and Ygritte. Um, she's basically heartbroken as all hell, she trusted him, she thought that he was on her side, all that stuff, um. And she basically has him at arrow point, um, and he knows that Ygritte loves him, and I believe that's true, and he loves her, and it's just, they're way too different, and it's just never going to work out. So it's a very sad relationship. She shoots him with an arrow three times, never piss off that woman, um, and, uh, but he does make it back to the Night's Watch, Castle Black, and that's where season four will start out. And uh, we go to Jamie Lannister, finally. And he is a character who a lot of people are starting to kind of grow attached to in many different ways. You see him in the first two seasons, he's kind of an asshole. Um, he's the one who pushed Bran out the window. Um, he, no one really liked him. He was kind of a stuck-up douche and uh, was kind of the pretty boy of the Lannisters. This season, he is at his lowest low in many different ways. He's basically on the run. He doesn't have his title, his name, his honor, um, anything which can really uh, help him anymore. He's basically on his own um, with Brian, And uh, their relationship, just like in the books, is a very complicated one, but it's one that changes as the season goes on. And that quickly happens in, I think, the third or fourth episode where um, Jamie Lannister does lose his sword hand. His right hand is cut off when he is captured, and uh, he, he attempts to make a threat saying, if you hurt me, my father will kill you, or something like that. Um, and that just pisses the guy off, and he mains Jamie's hand off. Uh, with that going on, uh, Jamie basically kind of goes into a severe depression. He falls off his horse multiple, multiple times, and it takes a lot for him to finally kind of get get back to somewhat of his old self, kind of realize there is more to this than just my sword hand. He has a reason to keep going. And then along with his um, bond with Brian, um, we see that uh, kind of starts to develop even further when uh, she is um, she is forced to stay behind and he can go off to King's Landing. He comes back for her and saves her from the bear. And um, that kind of shows us that they do have some sort of bond there and something which season one or two Jamie would never have done. Yeah, and then the very finale scene, he gets back to King's Landing. He goes to Cersei's chamber and that is basically the end of that plot arc for the season. Um, it'll be really interesting to see where it goes. It'll be really interesting to see where it goes at the beginning of season four because if my memory is correct, I don't think Jamie got back to King's Landing until the end of book three. Um, so, or maybe even at the beginning of book four, I don't even remember, but, um, I don't think it was this soon, so it'll be interesting to see how they kind of work that into it. And get right into Cersei, um, she basically has to deal with this whole season, her father is here, um, and Joffrey is basically still an asshole. Um, he is still an evil bastard king. More than anything, Cersei just wants her, her child back. Her innocent child, she, she talks about when Joffrey was a child, he was her everything, um, she was her reason for living, and um, that is a very interesting thing. Um, and then we have Marjorie coming 
Marjorie Tyrell come into the picture. Um, she is to be Joffrey's wife. <laughs> Cersei hates this woman. She thinks that she's going to be using Joffrey to kind of take over the kingdom. And uh, she is very much disapproved. She, she is slowly losing all power that she once had. And we will see that progress assuming that the story follows the books. But overall, she didn't really have a huge part to play in the season. Um, she had some, uh, she had some really important scenes, but it was nothing really immensely significant um, to the overall picture, as far as I remember. And then going on to the last member of uh, King's Landing, we have Tyrion Lannister, and uh, this is kind of the the one guy on the Lannister side who everyone has been rooting for since season one, and there's good reason why. He is probably the the most morally correct of everyone and we see that especially when he is forced to marry Sansa and on their wedding night um, that uh, he chooses not to bed her against her will he it's just like you can bed me when you're ready um, I it doesn't matter she asks what if I never want to um, and he's like he accepts that he realizes he may never sleep with her and he He's okay with that because he knows that this is not a marriage that she wanted to be in. Um, so that was kind of a cool thing. And then one thing that I found really, really interesting is a at the wedding between Tyrion and Sansa, um, how uh, um, the books seem to make it seem like uh, the wedding was much more embarrassing um, than uh, the TV show had it as. Um, like if I remember right in the book. Sansa is just completely not wanting to be there and not wanting to help out Tyrion at all. But, and we see this a tad bit um, in the way when he's supposed to put his cloak over. Um, and uh, at first she doesn't realize uh, that he's struggling and then he asks her to get down and um, she, she does that without hesitation. Um, in the book, um, it, was a much, it was much more of a hassle for Tyrion. Um, but in the TV show, they made that much quicker, and they made Sansa and Tyrion um, much more of kind of a, a group that can kind of deal with one another. Um, we see this especially in the finale episode. We see them walking on the path. They're actually having a conversation, um, which seems like a, a conversation where Sansa doesn't want to be anywhere but here. And um, I thought that was really interesting because as far as I remember, that is also not in the book. Now, I kind of like it and I thought that it worked well and it'll be interesting to see uh, how this changes, um, especially since now Rob Stark is dead and she knows that um, Tyrion's family is the ones are the ones behind that. All right, moving on to Bronn Stark. <laughs> Sorry this is so long, I really apologize. Um, but there's a lot to talk about. Bronn Stark, um, he didn't really have a huge role in the season. Um, he did kind of develop a little bit more though um, as the season went on. We see that he is a warg, um, I think that's the right word, um, and he can basically put himself, put or put his mind into the body of some other creature. He can put himself in uh, his dire wolf, he can put himself in Hogar. We saw this um, in, once again, the season 9, or the episode 9, um, episode, where uh, uh, John is getting attacked by wildlings and he takes control of his direwolf and goes and assists John. That was kind of cool. I like his relationship with Jojen um, because uh, it seems to reflect the book as far as I can remember. And it seemed to uh, kind of... Uh, Jojen kind of became his teacher and we have uh, the wildling lady who I do not remember the name of. Um, she is very much against this type of stuff, but he is kind of an expert at it by this point, and he knows kind of the ins and out of it. So, um, into season four with Bran and Jojen across the wall um, there into the north. I'll be very interested to see where they take um, that story arc. And now getting to the Mother of Dragons, we have Daenerys Targaryen. In this season, we have a very um, liberating woman. Um, she is very... Uh, she's very, the focus for her, a lot of her story arcs was the freedom of slaves, um, kind of just liberating as many people as she possibly can. We see this in the first half of the season with the Unsullied, 
Um, and in, I think, episode four, um, three or four, where she does take the Unsullied pretty much by force. Uh, and they are now her loyal warriors. We see the first set of that, and now she has an army with which, hypothetically, she could go and rule, rule Westeros, um, or conquer Westeros. But instead, she goes and uh, begins to sack some cities and gain more followers and free more slaves. We see this primarily in episodes 9 and 10, uh, where she sacks a city, which I don't remember the name of, and um, she... Uh, basically has all the slaves come out of their free will and they refer to her as Misa, which in uh, that language means mother. And uh, one thing that the IGN guys um, uh, commented on, which I agree, which is kind of interesting, she basically uh, tells them that they can choose their freedom and it's their choice, freedom is their choice. Um, and then when she goes into the crowd, it's very much a godlike moment um, where they kind of are seeming to be worshipping her almost as a god, um, not just as a mother or a protector, um, which is kind of honestly what a god could be, but um, I don't think that is originally what she intended it to be. Yeah, that's very interesting. We didn't get to see a very dramatic ending um, with the nearest season, but um, she did have some very good moments. and. Having read the books, I'm excited to see uh, where the show takes her with the rest of the series. Four more people. Uh, we have Arya, and um, she is probably the one who has changed the most from season one, episode one, to season three, episode ten. She started off as basically this innocent girl who wanted to kind of be one of the guys. Um, she got her sword, um, and just all this horrible stuff has happened to her. She witnessed her father's beheading, and then she uh, was forced to serve under Tywin Lannister. She got left by her friends. Um, she got stuck with the Hound. Um, nothing has been going right for her, really. And then in episode 9 and 10, uh, she we just kind of see what I'm assuming to be kind of the end to that whole innocence um because we have rob stark um well rob and catelyn get slaughtered at the red wedding and Arya is just inches away from being reunited with them and just all chaos breaks loose in episode 10 at the beginning we see um rob stark's decapitated body and then his dire wolf head attached to it and um that wasn't a scene that i was actually expecting the show to put into the um the show um but the fact that they did that, I think, scarred Arya, Arya even more, and then she chose to take out her revenge on um, one of the twins' men um, later on. So Arya Stark is probably one of the characters that we want to watch for the most, because her transformation is really something to be uh, a witness to. The last few books have really done her done her immense justice, I don't think. Uh, for readers of the book, um, book six, I'm really hoping, like, brings out her character even more and develops it even more. With, really quickly, with Sam, um, Sam Tarly, uh, he uh, is kind of a character who is slowly developing into kind of a courageous person. Um, at Caster's house, uh, where the Night's Watch basically goes into huge mutiny, uh, he takes Gilly and her child and kind of takes off. That is not something a season one Sam would have done. We see a lot of this transition between characters um, where uh, they, uh, especially with, well, now um, from what we see with uh, Jamie and um, now Sam, uh, where they were totally different people in season one and now they're doing things they would have never done back then. So, but Sam's relationship with Gilly, it's a very nice one. Um, but, but a very simplistic one at the same time. We see the beginnings of Sam um, as a central character. I don't know, the, he wasn't really a huge aspect of the season, um, as far as I can tell. He got a decent amount of screen time in a few episodes, but he wasn't really a huge part of the season. However, I am excited to see where they put him, um, or the role that he has um, in uh, season four. Two more. Uh, really quickly, Davos, um, his relationship with Gendry, um, 
we see kind of a father-son type of thing uh, in the finale, um, where he kind of talks to Gendry, who is being held prisoner by the Red Woman, um, and <clears throat> because he's the bastard son of Robert Baratheon, they realize that they come from kind of the same upbringing, but they've found themselves on two different roads, um, and uh, I think Davos kind of sees kind of his son in Gendry, and he sees a chance for kind of redemption, and... Uh, he does the right thing. He lets Gendry go. Um, obviously, if you've read the books, you know where he ends up, and you know, it'll be very interesting. Along with his relationship, yeah. along with his relationship with Stannis, um, that's been a really interesting thing because I think Stannis, he trusts um, Davos. He trusts his opinion. He's known the guy for years, but Melisandre has yet to be really wrong about anything. Her red, her, her god, obviously knows something, or it has some sort of power. We've seen that. He can't deny that either. So he's kind of at two sides of the court, and he is currently still on Melisandre's side. Um, but he knows now, at the end of season three, that he needs Davos for um, this whole Night's Watch deal, which is going to be a very interesting thing to play out. And lastly, sorry again that this is so long, we have Theon Greyjoy, who in the books we do not see until book five. I really, really like the fact that um, we are seeing him now after the sacking of Winterfell. Um, we see basically what's going to be leading up to the position that he is in in book five. We see in the finale episode, uh, uh, Ramsay basically uh, gives Theon the name that he is introduced as in book five, which is Reek. And this guy has just been tormented beyond all belief. He has been tortured. He thought he was going to be freed, and then he was not. Um, and it was just a cruel trick. Um, he had um, women come in and seduce him, and then that resulted in him getting his cock cut off, which is not cool. And, uh, yeah, Ramsey Bolton huge asshole, and um, one who I'm looking forward to seeing die sometime, um, um, whether it be in the books or in the show. So, uh, yeah, um, sorry again that this is so long. Um, that is my thoughts on uh, Season 3 of Game of Thrones, at least on the characters, and then I'm pretty sure I covered most of the story along with that. Um, there are a huge amount of themes, I'm not going to go into them here. As a whole, I enjoyed Game of Thrones Season 3 immensely. I'm very excited to see where Season 4 takes us. I'm sure that will be shown at Comic-Con, maybe, with some footage of that. I don't know for sure. I have no idea. But Season 4 should be very good. Um, and uh, So yeah, uh, playlist of the Game of Thrones reviews for the books that I've done are right up here. And... Um, uh, yeah, you can check out any of these other playlists up here as well. So, like, favorite, comment, and subscribe if you so choose. I'd appreciate it immensely. And once again, my good people, my name is Nick Bell, and once again, keep on watching.